You've been a voice for truth, which is a very rare thing, especially in a university setting. It frustrates me infinitely to see the kind of victimhood narrative that we currently see in the West. Now it's, am I a bigger victim than both of you? And if I am, then I win. Two decades ago, I've been warning people that once these type of parasitic ideas take hold in the universities, it's the end of science. There's a part of me that's a dogged defender of truth. I truly believe that less government intervenes in my life, the happier I am. Whatever I see nonsense, I attack it. Wow, what a crowd, what a crowd. Uh, thank you to Charlie Kirk and the Turning Point gang for having me here. What energy, it's unbelievable. To, uh, slight change of uh, maybe pace. I'd like to talk to you about happiness. This is probably the number one thing that people say that they'd like to achieve in life. And yet, of course, the devil is in the details. It's not always easy to know how to reach happiness. People call me the happy warrior, because even when I'm taking on all these difficult topics, I always seem to have a smile on my face. So I had the temerity of writing a book on happiness, which is not an easy thing to do because probably the number one topic that philosophers have talked about for several millennia has been how to live the good life. Now here's the genetic breakdown. About 50% of our differences in happiness scores come from our genes. But the good news is that there's another 50% that's up for grabs meaning that the types of decisions that I make, the types of mindsets that I adopt might either improve my, improve my sense of well-being or worsen it. And so what I'll talk about in the next 20 minutes is some of these key mindsets. So here's what Seneca, the ancient Greek uh, Roman Stoic said, there is not anything in this world perhaps that is more talked of and less understood than the business of a happy life. It is every man's wish and design, and yet not one of a thousand that knows wherein that happiness consists. And then Immanuel Kant, who was a philosopher a couple of hundred years ago, but it is a misfortune that the concept of happiness is such an indeterminate concept that although every human being wishes to attain this, he can still never say determinately and consistently with himself what he really wishes and wills. But there are certain things that we can do that statistically speaking can increase the likelihood of us being happy. So let's look at some of these. The first one I'd like to talk about is happiness as a positional emotion, meaning that it's not that I need to reach some absolute level of some metric that makes me happy, but rather I always compare myself to relevant others. And that is what either makes me happy or miserable. So keeping up with the Joneses, right? The neighbors have a nicer car, then that upsets me. I better up my game so that I could beat them in this kind of conspicuous consumption. Some of the young folks here might remember the 2015 teenage movie film, The Duff, The Designated Ugly Fat Friend. But there is a real psychological principle here, which is if I hang around with someone who is less attractive than me, that creates a contrast effect, and then that makes me better looking. By the way, Many of the people who took selfies with me happened to all be six foot five or taller. <laughs> that was not a recipe for my happiness. My testosterone levels really went down. So please, if you want to come up for selfies, be under five foot six. <laughs> uh, here's a study that I did with one of my former doctoral students. The, the dollar figures are from 2001, but now with Biden's inflation, we'd need to triple these. Uh, if I asked you, do you prefer to have a $600 salary increase and your colleague receives $800, or you get $500 and he or she gets $500? From a strict economic maximization perspective, you should prefer the 600 option because, because you want more money in your dollar, in your pocket, but most people prefer the 500-500. In other words, I prefer to receive less money as long as my competitor doesn't fare better than I do. Now, the next one is a really good one. It's easy to get people interested in anything related to sex. Happiness and sex, well, of course, on average, the more sex that we have, the happier we are, but here's the second part. 
I'm, re I'm a lot happier if all my friends have a lot less sex than I do. <laughs> so not only I have to have a lot of sex, but everyone around me should have less sex than me. So the life lesson is build a friends network with celibate people or asexual people. <laughs> Speaking of mating, this is actually a photo of my ridiculously lovely wife. Uh, we just celebrated 24 years together, by the way. This was in Portugal. We went there for, on a family vacation. So how do you choose the right life partner? Because that is a fundamental marker for happiness. If you choose the right one, you'll be happy. If you choose the wrong one, you'll be in, an, in a dark abyss. There are two maxims that operate here. There is, in, in evolutionary psychology, there's the birds of a feather flock together or the opposites attract. Now for short-term dalliance, opposites attract might work. I may be introverted, my prospective suitor or lady might be an extrovert and that complements one another and it might be a very nice experience. But for long-term stability, the research is overwhelmingly clear, it's birds of a feather flock together. Now on which feathers are you flocking together? You have to have shared belief systems, shared values. So if someone, if you meet someone at turning point and they happen to be a closeted blue-haired wokester, the chances of you being, have, you know, having a happy marriage is probably close to nil. So choose your partner wisely. Choosing the right profession is also very important. One of the reasons why I think I'm situationally happy is because I love what I do. I operate all day long in a world of ideas. I create new knowledge and I disseminate knowledge. I'm perpetually engaging in intellectual play, which I'll talk about in a second. So I argue that there are two things that you should pursue when you are seeking a job that's going to hopefully give you maximal happiness. So if possible, any job that allows you to instantiate your creative impulse, all other things equal is gonna give you greater purpose and meaning. Nothing wrong with you know, forensic accountants and insurance adjusters, but they probably don't wake up in the morning and say, thank God I'm an insurance adjuster. Whereas a chef, an architect, a stand-up comic, an author, they're operating in different worlds, but they are all creating things. And that, as I said, gives you purpose and meaning. And then the other thing is to seek temporal freedom. I work very, very long hours. I, I often work 12, 14 hour days, but I never feel like I'm working because I'm, I'm, I'm like a vagabond. So I can go for three hours to sit at a cafe to think about my next book, and then I go off and I meet a graduate student, and then I think about something else that I'm working on. And so the fact that I'm not, I don't have scheduling asphyxia brings me great happiness. So if you can hit those two markers, you're likely to have a fulfilling uh, professional career. I also talk in the book about something that Aristotle taught us 2,000 plus years ago. He talked about the golden mean, right? All things in moderation. He said that a soldier who is too cowardly is not good. A soldier who is too reckless in his bravery is going to die very quickly. And the optimal point is somewhere in the middle. And so what I show in that chapter is that this is probably the number one universal law for optimal flourishing. A bewildering number of phenomena adhere to this inverted U. How perfectionist you are. If you're not perfectionist enough, your work suffers. If you're too much of a perfectionist as I am, you sit there obsessing over every comma if it's in the right place, and you end up losing a lot of productive time because you're obsessing in a pathological perfectionist way. Stress follows an inverted U. Your parenting style, if you're too laissez-faire, it's not good. If you're too much of an overbearing parent, it's not good. Somewhere in the middle is the optimal point. Exercise intensity follows it. Alcohol consumption follows it. Fish consumption follows it. How many times you should repeat an ad in an, in an advertising campaign also follows it. So in a bewildering number of cases, life is ultimately about seeking that sweet spot. I also talk in the book about, as I said earlier, about living life as though it's a playground, right? It's regrettable that in, this, in the same way that we lose our baby teeth and then we grow our adult teeth, people think of play in a similar manner. You play as a child, but then you grow it out. You grow out of it. Nothing could be further from the truth. I think one of the reasons why I resonate with people is because 
you know, I can not take myself seriously. I could joke, I could be very professorial, but I can also be a complete jokester. So Patch Adams, if you remember the movie that, that Robin Williams played, he's a physician, I think he's still, still alive. He deals in a very, very difficult set of circumstances. He takes care of sick children, and yet he's constantly being a clown and playing. The argument being that there are actual medicinal properties that you benefit from in being able to laugh and play. The movie Life is Beautiful, which won the Academy Award in 1997, was about how a father and his son, while stuck in the, in the Holocaust, in the concentration camps, he tried to protect his child by making it seem as though the entire Holocaust was just a play session. The, the next one, you see a sniper, that actually comes from my personal history. I grew up in the Lebanese Civil War, and my, my parents would tell me, one of the ways that you would die in, the, in Lebanon was that there were these snipers in the, at the top of buildings that would just blow up the brains of anybody who walked within their visual field. And so they would tell me, okay, go outside and play, but don't pass this particular imaginary line because that would open you up to the, uh, to the visual field of the snipers. So even in such dire circumstances, the innate need to play was there. Science is a form of play, right? And there are several scientists, myself included, who've argued that science is nothing but you know, highbrow intellectual play. You're trying to see which variable correlates with which other variables, what causes what other variable. So it's, a, it's the ultimate, you know, thousand piece puzzle. Dogs, these are actually our dogs, Belgian Shepherds. Uh, if you live your life without dogs, you're really missing out. Uh, a dog says, love me, rub my belly, give me food, I'll take care of everything else. I'll sniff your bombs. I'll take you off out of avalanches. I'll protect you. I mean, try to burglarize our house with these guys around. Belgian shepherds are absolutely insane. All I ask in return is take some time to play with me. That's a pretty good deal. And then here is actually a Photoshop picture of me that's became famous on the internet. A, a fan did it. By the way, uh, someone at the university tried to fire me because I posted a photoshopped image of me because I was making fun of transgender people. <laughs> and in this case, th this alter ego is known as Fierce Sally. <laughs> it, yes, there are some more wigs there. I'll get to that in a second. Uh, it turns out the research shows, maybe that's a surprise people in this room, that conservatives have repeatedly scored higher than liberals and progressives, I mean, in scientific studies. Now, I argue speculatively, but I think it's a, it's a pretty good argument that, so here's the argument why that happens. Conservatives wake up in the morning and say, well, sure, there are things wrong in our society, but by definition, there are things worth conserving. There are ideas that have stood the test of time. And so overall, I live in a good society, so I, I'm existentially happy. The progressive wakes up in an existential gloom. We are in a racist society, misogynistic, ableist, transphobic, Islamophobic. And therefore, we need to eradicate the status quo, and just around the corner, we can find unicornia. So that's why I've got images of a whole bunch of unicorns. <laughs> just, it's just around the corner. Let's just bring down a few more statues, and everything will be in place. And of course, to the point about playing and being happy, this is an assortment, a, a buffet, a panoply of wigs that I have worn on my show to demonstrate my woke ideological fierceness. Now, if you see the last slide, I'm showing you here, I, I'm next to a frog. Now, why is that? I'm an, I'm an evolutionist, I'm an evolutionary psychologist. And so in evolutionary biology, there's the principle of aposomatic coloring, which is the opposite of the evolution of camouflaging. It's where an animal evolves very bright colors, which you would think at first thought well, why would you want to be conspicuous to predators? The idea is, of course, that if you could see me so well, it's probably because you want to avoid me and I am venomous. Well, I've argued that the hair coloring of the wokesters is exactly a form of aposomatic coloring. <laughs> Variety as the spice of life, that's another chapter. So let, if you look at the top, uh, row, 
buffets, we love them. If you go out to an all-inclusive, you end up on average putting on five pounds per week that you're there. So if you go for a two-week all-inclusive, that's 10 pounds, so be careful because it's easy for us to hoard a lot of food because we've evolved in an environment of caloric scarcity and caloric uncertainty. Just to give you a sense of how much our brains are tricked by the desire for variety, if you give people one colored M&Ms or multicolored M&Ms, even though objectively speaking, they taste exactly the same, people end up eating a lot more from the multicolored bowl. Or next to it, there's the pasta, one shaped pasta, or multi-shaped pastas, it's the exact same pasta, people end up hoarding a lot more from the multi-shaped pasta. So variety can be a, a bit of a quicksand trap. The, below, you see variety seeking where, that's why I put sometimes, in some cases you may not want to instantiate your desire for variety seeking, especially in the mating domain, especially if you're married. So on the one hand, we've evolved the desire for long pair bonding, because we have, we're a biparental species and we have children that take a long time to reach sexual maturity. But on the other hand, both men and women have, already, have also evolved the desire for sexual variety seeking. I'll leave it for you to navigate through that conundrum. And then the last, the last image I have here that deals with variety seeking, this is the Vitruvian man. This is a drawing from Leonardo da Vinci. The reason I put it up is because Leonardo da Vinci is the ultimate interdisciplinary guy. He never stayed in one lane. He was an anatomist and an engineer and a painter and a sculptor and a futurist. And so I try to live my life, at certainly my academic life this way, which is exactly what they tell you to not do as a professor. Stay in your lane, be hyper-specialized. Life is too short to only navigate through one ecosystem. Uh, on persistence and the anti-fragility of failure, the first uh, image to the left is Lionel Messi. It happens to be that today is the one-year anniversary of Argentina winning the World Cup. I, don't, I think I was less stressed going through the Lebanese Civil War than watching the final of the World Cup last year. <laughs> because I truly felt that th there would be no cosmic justice in the universe if this gorgeous player did not win the World Cup. Now, why do, I have, why do I have him up here? Because he was told that he was too small of a player to be a professional player. He quit the national team in 2016 because he kept having heartbreaks with the national team, and yet he came back. He was anti-fragile to failure, as was Michael Jordan, who was cut from his sophomore high school team as was J.K. Rowling, who was rejected by every single publisher until the last one who accepted her, as was Steven Spielberg, who was rejected not once, not twice, but three times by the USC Film School. And so Seneca said that the strong trees are the ones that face a lot of wind stressors because by facing those stressors, they develop non-brittle roots. And so life is also like that. If you're always in an echo chamber, if any, controversial idea makes me, you know, go into a fetal position, that's probably not an optimal way to live life. I'm almost done, two more slides. It's, uh, I have a chapter on regret, right? It turns out that there are two types of regret. There are regret due to actions. I regret that I cheated on my wife and now I'm divorced. So that's a regret due to an action versus regret due to inaction. I regret that I never became an artist and I became a pediatrician because my dad and his dad were pediatricians. Well, it may or may not surprise you that the biggest looming regrets that most people have over the long run are regrets due to inaction, the roads not taken. And so if you see here, I've got five, the five biggest regrets that people on their deathbed uh, enunciate, uh, the first of which is, I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me, meaning existential authenticity. Now, I have two photos here of two remarkable guys who didn't think it was too late for them to pursue their dreams. On the left is actually a gentleman from my own university. He had left 
Nazi Germany as a young man. He had never pursued his university education because he had to work. Pragmatic realities forced him to work. In his 60s, when he retired, he began his undergrad. In his 70s, he began his master's. And when he was 92, he finished his PhD. One year later, he passed away. So it's never too late. And the other gentleman has been on my show, Manfred Steiner. He obtained a MD, became a medical doctor in 1955, picked up a PhD in 1967 in biochemistry, but his real love in life was always physics. So after he retired from medicine, already a man in his 70s, he started studying physics and obtained his second PhD at the age of 89 in physics, and now he's feverishly working on publishing papers. He's in his 90s, so it's never too late. <laughs> Last slide about the importance of gratitude and contextualizing whatever you're feeling in terms of, you know, you're having a bad spell in your life. The gentleman on the left, David McCallum, is arguably the greatest guest I've ever had on my show, and you've probably never heard of him. He spent 29 years in prison for a murder of which he eventually was exonerated. And as we were chatting, I looked at him, I said, David, you're a much better man than I am because you're, you're like the reincarnation of Buddha because there is no rancor in your life. There is no vengefulness. I would want to burn the world down if somebody took 29 years of my life. And then he answered, well, I have a sister who has cerebral palsy and she is bedridden and she finds a way to smile. So really what I went through wasn't so bad. So he was able to contextualize having three decades of his life stolen because someone else had it worse. And then finally, Bijan Gelani is someone that I met when I was a professor at University of California, Irvine. He was a doctoral student then. He was doing his PhD on studying the homeless community, but he was a very wealthy man, independently wealthy. He finished his PhD many years later a reporter tracked him down and found out that he had become homeless through the vagaries of life. And the car that you see right there is his house. That's where he lives. And when he was asked, are you happy? He said, well, why wouldn't I be happy? I have a library. I have a card to the Newport Beach Public Library so I can go and nourish my mind all day. I have a card to the Newport uh, gym. I could keep my body healthy. I'm a moral person, I'm a knowledgeable person, I have no reason to not be happy. So contextualize whatever you're going through, be grateful, and thank you very much.